Good morning, and welcome back to UCI Minds monthly Facebook Live series, Ask the Doc, Alzheimer's Research Today. This is our fifth episode of the series, and today we will be addressing, is there a blood test for Alzheimer's disease? I'm Chelsea Cox, I'm your host for this series, and I'm the Associate Director of Education for UCI Mind, which is one of 32 congressionally designated Alzheimer's disease research centers across the country, and the only center right here in Orange County. We're located on UCI campus. UCI Mind is um, a collection of over 100 faculty, staff, and students who have dedicated their lives to solving Alzheimer's disease and related disorders. Um, and this series, our goal is to bring our researchers and experts to you, to the Facebook community, to be able to discuss the latest advances in Alzheimer's disease research and to answer your questions. And today, I'm excited to be joined by Dr. Mark Mapstone. Welcome, Dr. Mapstone. Good morning, good to be here. And just to briefly introduce Dr. Mapstone, he received his PhD in clinical psychology from Northwestern University, and he currently serves as faculty in um, professor of neurology in the, U in the UCI School of Medicine. And Dr. Mapstone is a clinical neuropsychologist, as well as a translational neuroscientist. So what that means is that his work aims to translate findings from the laboratory into improved um, medical care and clinical care for patients. Dr. Mapstone has dedicated over 20 years to the study of brain aging and Alzheimer's disease, and throughout his tenure, he's received numerous academic distinctions. So it's really an honor to have you with us today to discuss blood biomarkers for Alzheimer's. My Thanks pleasure. Here. Um, and thank you to all of those who are attending live right now. Um, if this is your first time visiting us the way or attending this um, seminar, the way that this works is I'll begin and get us warmed up by asking Dr. Mapstone a few questions. And then as you have questions that come up, please go ahead and type them there in the comments box. And Dr. Mapstone will try to answer as many of your questions as he can in the half hour that we have here together today. So to begin, um, Dr. Mapstone, I always like to learn how it is that you got interested in studying Alzheimer's disease and how you got started in this field. Well, uh, I got to go way back. Um, <clears throat> I guess um, it probably all, st I've, I've always had an interest in lifespan developmental psychology, which is uh, trying to understand how we develop and grow as people across uh, our lives. And as I was um, finishing up my undergraduate degree, um, this was sort of a, a, a hot field. Uh, this was in the late 80s. Um, and so this was kind of a hot field. And I was uh, very interested in, in developmental psychology and, and lifespan psychology, um, particularly in the aging age, so the, in, with older adults. Um, right out of undergrad, I then went uh, to work in a laboratory studying human memory, um, which took me a little bit farther out of um, aging, uh, and I was working with an amnesic patient, uh, several amnesic patients in a research laboratory, and some of the work we started to do was with patients with Alzheimer's disease, obviously because they have uh, memory impairments, and we were trying to learn about the memory deficits that these individuals had. Um, and what I think compelled me the most was really the, the individual stories these are these are real people um, going through these changes that they don't understand, um, and and I realized that I had a, an ability to make an impact on on individual lives and, and people with Alzheimer's disease. So I switched from frank um, um, you know interest in amnesia and memory per se to the condition of Alzheimer's disease, and uh, then went on to do training in, in focusing in, in clinical neuropsychology of older adults. Okay. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and your recent work has focused on developing blood biomarkers, blood tests for Alzheimer's disease. Um, so just to uh, talk a little bit first and share with the audience, what exactly um, is a, bio, a biomarker or a biological marker, and how exactly are they identified? Well, uh, yeah, that's a good question. So biomarkers, um, a biomarker is something that we can measure reliably and um, quantitatively that defines some underlying bi biological process. So 
Um, what I'm interested in is biomarkers or things that we can measure in the blood that tell us about the underlying biology of Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. um, a good example of a biomarker that you might be more familiar with is something like um, uh, blood pressure is, a, is an easily measured biomarker for underlying cardiac disease. Okay. So by monitoring blood pressure, we can keep an eye on um, the biology of cardiac disease. And so blood pressure is an easy thing to get. Um, it's fairly sensitive to, to what's actually going on in the biology and gives us reliable information about the underlying um, cardiovascular system. Okay. So what we're looking for is a way to do that for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and there are a number of challenges there, but um, what you want is something that is able to reliably um, give you an index of what's going on in the biology. Uh, but also it has to be easily accessible. So you've got to get something that you can get at real easily. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the current challenges is that we don't have um, necessarily any super easy things to get that tell us about the underlying biology. So these are things that require expensive um, scans of the brain, mm -hmm. um, that require um, uh, procedures that have risk, like getting a cerebral spinal fluid. Mm -hmm. um, so the move to get things that are very easy to access, like in blood, I would say most of us have had experience with um, giving giving samples of blood for other medical tests. Yeah. So this is something that most people are, are familiar with, and um, it's fairly easy to get. So blood biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease are, is a really um, um, pressing need right now. Okay. And are there any blood tests that are currently routinely used to diagnose Alzheimer's disease? And we have a question here um, along those lines from uh, somebody who's attending. Do blood, do if there are those blood tests, um, do blood markers for Alzheimer's disease also detect other dementias? Yeah, so I, I think to, to answer your first question, are there currently used um, approved um, blood biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease? The short answer is no, there aren't. Mm -hmm. And that's why this is such an active area. So you, you cannot currently go to your physician or uh, a health practitioner and ask for a blood biomarker, a diagnostic test. There are ways that people can look at, for example, genes that confer risk, but none of these are, are direct um, uh, indicators of the disease. So they only tell you about your relative risk for getting the disease. Uh, so, so the short answer is no, there's no currently approved uh, blood biomarker or test for Alzheimer's disease. Okay. Um, but we are um, working very hard to, to develop these. Mm -hmm. and, and in doing this, um, are you, <clears throat> would you have to develop blood tests that um, for different types of dementia or would one blood test be able to detect all different kinds of dementia like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease and other things? Yeah, so um, it's, it's likely that one blood test is not going to tell you about your risk or whether you have different kinds of diseases. Mm -hmm. um, what you really want in a, in a biomarker is specificity. That is, you want a, a test that's going to tell you about that specific disease. And the challenge with dementias in general is that a lot of them can look alike um, uh, in, in the behavior that they produce, meaning um, many of them are, are associated with cognitive changes, particularly memory loss. But that memory loss might be due to different underlying biology. So in Alzheimer's disease, it might be related to the presence of proteins in the brain that are abnormal. Um, they're, they're not supposed to be there in the, in the quantities that they are. But in other cases, the memory disorder might be related to, for example, uh, vascular changes. That is the way that the blood flow gets to the cells in the brain in the way that metabolic waste from those cells gets out of the brain. So those two very different mechanisms could cause the same outward behavioral impairment. And what you really need is a biomarker that's going to tell you which mechanism is involved. Mm. So in some ways, a biomarker that gives you kind of broad information might not be as useful for specific treatments, developing treatments. And, and really, that's where we're going with biomarkers is um, these are going to enable us to develop treatments because uh, currently we don't have uh, good treatments for, for Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. So what mechanisms of <clears throat> Alzheimer's disease are you looking at in blood for blood biomarkers? Well, currently, the, the, the major thrust has been in the accumulation of these uh, misfolded proteins. So there are proteins that normally occur in the body um, and that in Alzheimer's disease, 
for example, you get more of these proteins that are folded in the wrong way um, and tend to accumulate and uh, develop these plaques in the brain. And these, these proteins are called beta amyloid. Uh, this protein is called beta amyloid. And then there's another protein called tau, um, which is involved in uh, inside the cells and the neurons. Um, and these two proteins uh, accumulate in the brain in, in, in areas of the brain that do important things for memory. And so the focus lately uh, for the past probably 100 years since Alzheimer first described the disease has been to look at the presence of these two proteins. Mm -hmm. And so many biomarkers have been focused on looking at these two proteins in the brain. Okay. But there's other stuff going on and there's a greater appreciation now that Alzheimer's disease uh, affects many organ systems in the body and it's not just limited to the central nervous system in the brain. Mm -hmm. um, it, it does affect, uh, Alzheimer's disease does affect other organ systems, um, the liver function, kidneys, uh, cardiovascular, et cetera. Okay. So other biomarkers might be useful. Yeah, so although the major, major thrust has been on these proteins, um, other, other biomarkers might be something that we should be looking for. Okay. Um, if you're just joining us live, um, you, as your questions come up for Dr. Mapstone, you can go ahead and type them there in the comments box and he'll answer, be happy to answer as many questions as he can. Um, and please do remember that whatever you write down is linked to your name and visible to others. Um, so going off of that, uh, we know you answered already, there is currently no approved blood test um, to diagnose Alzheimer's disease. Um, how close are we, would you say, to finding that type of blood test? Well, um, I'm bullish. I, I, I think that there's um, great hope for, for us developing markers from blood that can tell us about uh, risk for Alzheimer's disease and, and characterizing the disease and, and tracking and staging the disease. I think that, that, we, that this is going to happen um, certainly in our lifetimes, and I think, I, I hope soon. Mm -hmm. The good thing is, is that we now have uh, a, a, a great number of resources that we have available to us that we didn't even 10 years ago. Um, and these are resources and technology, so new technologies that are being developed, um, but also funding. Uh, funding has been increased um, greatly for this sort of work. So um, I, I think that the, 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 uh, the indicators are pointing toward, um, toward us finding something within the next probably five to 10 years. Okay. And I, um, you, know, you hear that a lot, that there's this next five-year window or mm -hmm. within 10 years we're optimistic, but we are really... Um, moving along quite rapidly in, in the blood biomarker space, and there's a lot of good work going on uh, around the world. Okay. Once, once a blood test <clears throat> for Alzheimer's disease and, and related diseases is identified, how exactly would it be used by doctors or by researchers? Well, um, so different biomarkers can be used for different indications or different purposes. Mm -hmm. um, one reason why you would want to use a biomarker is preliminary screening. Okay. That is to say, you want to identify people who are at the greatest risk and at the earliest stages of the disease. Okay. And the notion is that um, at those earliest stages, the, the accumulation of these proteins and the underlying biological processes are still sort of... Um, simmering along. They haven't hit rapid um, development yet. Okay. And those might be the times when interdiction might be the most successful. Mm -hmm. So these are the people you want to identify, and a biomarker for screening might be something that you, you apply broadly. One might envision a screening biomarker, something that you do at a yearly uh, visit after age 60 or 65 mm -hmm. or something like this. Okay. And what it would do is probably trigger, um, it not necessarily indicate that you have the disease, but rather trigger another set of steps, okay. a cascade of other steps that might involve more invasive procedures like an MRI scan, uh, maybe a PET scan to look at the proteins in the brain, maybe a lumbar puncture to get at um, the proteins in the cerebrospinal fluid. So a screening blood test might be useful for identifying those that are at the greatest risk that need further follow-up. Okay. Another way that you might use blood biomarkers is in clinical trials. So it's very important for us to develop therapies, which, um, as I mentioned before, we don't really have um, very good treatments for this disease yet. Uh, there are certainly no cures, um, and we don't have good ways to slow it down. There are no ways to slow the disease down. So one way that we might use a biomarker is to, to look at screening people to get into trials to test new drugs mm -hmm. or new interventions. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a drug. Um, these could be things like exercise or diet. 
um, cognitive stimulation and, and uh, cognitive training, all sorts of different ways to change the way that the brain is functioning and maybe um, change the course of, of the, the disease. So we might use biomarkers uh, that are easily accessible in the context of a clinical trial for getting people into the trial who, who we're pretty sure have the disease, and then also um, tracking the effects of any intervention, mm -hmm. whether they're actually working or not. Okay. And then hopefully once a, once a preventative or disease-delaying drug is developed in the future, then when those blood tests are used in clinical practice that um, indicate risk, a person can maybe be prescribed a medicine that prevents or delays the onset. Yeah, we hope. That right? would be the future. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the idea is that eventually when we, we use these biomarkers for trials and we develop drugs that actually that are working, um, then we can use the, the biomarker to, to identify people who need the drug mm -hmm. and get it to them. Um, looks like we have a question here from one of our viewers. Uh, currently, is the PET scan um, the most accurate method to predict future or impending Alzheimer's disease? So by this, I think PET scan, you're referring to uh, an amyloid PET or a tau PET. So the, a PET scan is a special kind of brain scan that allows you to view the presence of these two proteins that I mentioned earlier in the brain uh, while you're lying there on the table. And um, these are used um, primarily in research. Um, they are not uh, necessarily indicated in routine clinical practice, but some people do get them. Um, so what this PET scan tells you is, is the amount of protein and, and where it is in your brain. And the idea is that if you have uh, an increased amount in certain areas of the brain, it might indicate the underlying diseases there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, so the question is, is this the best way to get it? Um, currently, I, I would say that, that a PET scan is, is probably, if you want to measure the amount of amyloid in the brain or tau in the brain, a PET scan is probably the best way to do that. Um, you can also do that by um, a lumbar puncture, which is where they put a, a needle into your back and, and draw out cerebral spinal fluid from um, around your spine and um, can measure these proteins in the spinal fluid because the spinal fluid is directly in contact with the brain. And so you can measure the amount of proteins in the spinal fluid. That would be the other um, probably most reliable way to measure those two proteins. Okay. The issue really is that um, there's not a direct 100% a direct relationship between the presence of these proteins in the brain as revealed by a PET scan and the presence of the behavioral symptoms. And just to clarify, what that means is that you can have proteins in your brain at an abnormal level, but not have any behavioral symptoms at all. That is, you're functioning normally. Mm -hmm. So the brain can have some burden of protein and still do what it needs to do so mm -hmm. that you don't have symptoms. So that's, that's one of the flies in the ointment because if it were just the, the, the amount of amyloid in the brain, then yes, a PET scan would, would give you the answer you need. But um, it doesn't work all the time and for every case. Is okay. The idea. okay. Um, and just to go back a little bit to the symptomology of the disease, one of the viewers here has more of a comment, but um, mentioned that memory loss is well known, uh, a well-known symptom of dementia. But what about symptoms such as confusion? Mm -hmm. And how does that play a role in the disease? Well, um, so uh, the, currently the, the gold standard for a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease is a clinical evaluation that includes cognitive testing and showing impairment in cognitive abilities. Mm -hmm. um, those cognitive abilities can be uh, wide ranging. Most of the time it's memory impairment. Mm -hmm. So for the majority of individuals who have Alzheimer's disease, the primary thing that the primary cognitive problem is, is memory loss and typically short-term memory loss. Things that you've done or heard or seen recently that you can't retrieve or recall, but things that are long-term in the past, you can still hold on to. That sort of problem is the typical way that, that Alzheimer's disease manifests in, in most people. However, um, there are other behavioral phenotypes of Alzheimer's disease. And these include primary problems, not in memory, but in other cognitive domains. And these things are like language, coming up with words when you need them. Um, it can be <clears throat> visual, uh, spatial uh, orientation, uh, difficulty navigating when you're driving. Uh, you get to some place that you should know where you are and it doesn't look familiar. 
um, maybe getting lost when you walk around the neighborhood, misplacing objects around the home. Um, and it could be confusion. Uh, it could be difficulty with sort of orientation to time and place, not knowing um, what you're supposed to do in certain situations. And that might be more related to executive dysfunction, um, planning, um, higher order cognitive abilities. So Alzheimer's disease um, often looks like a memory problem first and worst. That's the, the typical axiom. Um, but it can take other presentations as well. Mm -hmm. One of the most common questions we get when we're out in the community um, is, you know, how do I know that it's Alzheimer's disease versus just normal memory loss as I get older? Yeah. Well, that's that's a really tough question. And yeah. that's that's um, uh, I would say to anybody listening um, that if if you do have concerns about your memory to first talk to your primary care doctor. Um, who will then uh, refer you if needed and necessary for a more extensive evaluation. But this is why people um, do what I do, which is do in-depth cognitive evaluations to determine the nature of the cognitive symptoms, mm -hmm. um, how severe they are and what domains they're affecting, but then also to pull that back to what we know about the underlying biology and whether this could be, for example, Alzheimer's disease, could it be due to a medication side effect? Could it be due to poor sleep? Could it be due to um, a number of different things? Yeah. So you really do need that level of detail um, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes. Okay. Another question here from a viewer, um, is autopsy still considered the only way to diagnose Alzheimer's disease with complete certainty? So as far as I know, yes, that's still the, 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 uh, the gold standard for definitive diagnosis. So um, you need to actually look at the brain tissue and to quantify or to count the number of plaques that are present in particular areas of the brain. Um, the PET scans that we can get while you're still living give us an idea of how much of the amyloid is there, but it doesn't necessarily show up in the same way as it does when you actually look at the tissue. So. Yes, the definitive diagnosis is made at autopsy. Um, for most of these, um, for example, if you go to a specialist in Alzheimer's disease, or you come to an Alzheimer's disease research center like the one we have here at UCI, and there are 30 plus other ones around the country, um, the correlation between the diagnosis that we can give when you're still alive mm -hmm. and that those autopsy findings is very high. It's probably over 90%. So. When we see you in our specialty clinics, we've got pretty good accuracy while you're still living about the diagnosis, but we're not always right. We, we are wrong. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then just going back to blood tests really quick, um, when working with blood biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease, is it important to look at different populations that, that may be affected by the disease, say people with Down syndrome or different racial ethnic backgrounds? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. Um, the Alzheimer's disease as we know it that occurs in the general population is something we refer to as late onset or sporadic Alzheimer's disease, mm -hmm. uh, for which there are no known um, direct genetic contributions for late onset sporadic Alzheimer's disease. Uh, it's probably multigenetic, multifactorial, and we just don't understand those, those, all of those factors yet. There are other populations that get different kinds of Alzheimer's disease that are more directly related to um, genetic contributions. And these include cases where there's a direct, dominantly inherited um, genetic contribution. That is to say, you inherit a gene, well, you inherit two genes, uh, two, uh, one from each parent. And if you inherit one of the bad genes, um, you, you will get the disease. So this is a dominantly inherited um, uh, gene defect that leads uh, universally to the development of the disease. Um, and so those people are very interesting to study because mm -hmm. they can tell us about the gene effects um, of, of developing the disease. But very rare. Rare. Yeah. So in, in Alzheimer's disease, probably 90% of the cases or, or higher are these um, sporadic cases where we don't know of any direct genetic contributions. Uh, less than 10% are directly related to a gene defect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, lastly, I just want to wrap up by asking um, what, Dr. Mapstone, you're most excited about in um, the future of Alzheimer's disease research and the things that you're working on right now. What do you see the most promise in? 
Well, I think, as I mentioned before, that that we really are, um, I think, on the cusp of, of making some major advancements. Um, we have had a number of failures in therapeutic trials, but I think the development of these biomarkers is really going to get us on the right track. And I think the field is starting to open itself up to more um, questioning about, are we asking the right questions? Are we pursuing the right angles? And I think that that's very healthy for the field, and I, I think it's necessary. So as we sort of um, introspectively look at what we're doing and sort of avenues that we're pursuing, I think that opens us up for new discovery. And I, I do think that that's going to come. And, and furthermore, we, we've got new technologies coming online that are going to allow us to see um, these changes in the blood with more specificity uh, that I think will enable us to develop these blood biomarkers. So, Well, thank you for all the work that you're doing and your dedication to solving Alzheimer's. And thanks for your time for attend, um, being on our Facebook Live episode today and answering questions from the community and from me. Um, similar to this <clears throat> live Ask the Doc session, UCI Mine hosts quarterly in-person Ask the Doc sessions throughout the Orange County community. And the next session is actually going to be next Thursday. Um, June 13th from 1.30 to 3.30 at the Bowers Museum in Santa Ana. So if you live locally in the Orange County community, we hope you'll join us and you can register at www.mind.uci.edu slash Bowers. If you're interested in participating in research at UCI and helping researchers like Dr. Mapstone answer these important questions about Alzheimer's and, and medical um, research, you, the best way to learn about studies that you might be eligible for is to register for the UCI Consent to Contact Registry or the C2C Registry. And you can register for that online at c2c.uci.edu. And if you'd like to just in general learn more about UCI Mind and Dr. Mapstone's research and um, other researchers at UCI Mind, you can visit our website at mind.uci.edu. Um, so, Dr. Mapstone, thank you again. Viewers, thank you for attending today and asking important questions. And please mark your calendars for our session next month, which will be the second Friday of the month, July 12th, at, again at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And next month, I'll be joined by Dr. Stephen Tam. He is a UCI Mind geriatrician and he's going to answer questions about current medications for Alzheimer's disease. So we hope to see you next time and thanks very much for joining. Take care.